Alec Murdoch has been charged with the unthinkable, the execution-style murders of his wife and son. But what makes this even more shocking is who Alec Murdoch is and the history of his family in the low country of South Carolina. His family's prominence in the legal community began 100 years ago with his great-grandfather who served as solicitor and continued with each generation that followed. Alec, likewise, was a successful lawyer. He enjoyed immense power, privilege, and influence until his world began to unravel. Drug addiction, allegations of stealing from his law firm and from his clients, and now, double murder charges. The trial is taking place in the same place where he and his family wielded their power. And now the question is, will A. Murdoch be convicted by this same community? We are live in the Low Country for day one of jury selection in the Murdoch family murder trial. I'm Vinny Politan. Great to have you with us here on Court TV. Closing arguments. Big, big night tonight. You know this is the start. We've been talking about it for months now. And today, finally, day one of jury selection. This is what we do at Court TV. We cover big trials. And trust me, this is a big trial. We've covered them through the years, from O.J. Simpson to that woman down in Florida to Jody Arias to Kyle Rittenhouse uh, to Officer Derek Chauvin, former Officer Derek Chauvin, um, Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. It's always Court TV, and it continues to be Court TV. Our cameras, our microphones inside that courtroom to bring you every moment so you can see and hear the testimony and the evidence. I mentioned this is a big one, Alec Murdoch on trial. Day one, day one of jury selection. It's always a significant day. It's always the day of where it becomes a reality. You know, the buildup to a murder trial, it starts, you know, there's a crime, then they try to solve it, then they charge someone, then there are arraignments, and then there are all these motions and, and trying to get out on bond and all this other stuff happens. And it's always in the, th you know, it's kind of like, yeah, there's going to be a trial, there's going to be a trial. Then it happens. Today is that day. You've got all these citizens being called down to the courthouse. It's time to find out who that jury is, and it all began today. Now, what makes this big trial a little different than the rest is the defendant, number one, but number two, where it is. I mean, it's like a small town trial. Small town, big trial. Small town, big trial. Don't see that too often either. You know, a lot of times these big cases are in big cities or, you know, they're in places where there are lots and lots of people. This is a, a, a close-knit, very closed community. And it's a community that the Murdochs have been a part of for years. I mean, Alex's father and grandfather and great-grandfather were bigwigs in the legal world, in the criminal legal world, as solicitors deciding who gets charged and what they get charged for. And now everything's been turned upside down in the low country. Day one of jury selection. The big question though is at this point, because of all that power and all that influence that they've had through the years, is there a hometown advantage for Alec Murdoch at this point? I don't know, I don't know. You know the one thing that, that normally happens in a big case with all this publicity, the first thing the defense does is they jump and say, Your Honor, we need to change the venue. Got to get out of, we got to get out of Dodge. We got to go somewhere else to try this case. They haven't done that. Alec Murdoch wants to be tried by the people in the community where he has lived and his family has lived for generations. They don't want some outsiders judging him. Another fascinating part of this case, fascinating part of this case, because of the level of stature that they had at one point. And with all this negative, and it's all negative, right? Before a trial, def criminal defendants don't get good publicity. It's usually negative, which, which is usually why the attorneys come in and say, no, Your Honor, we can't try it here. These people can't be fair and impartial because they've heard too much, they know too much. Well, trust me, I think everyone knows about this case pretty much in the low country, but they're still going to get a jury and they're going to get it 
where this all happened. Big trial. Chanley Painter has the story for us tonight. Richard Ellen Murdoch, if that is your name, please raise your right hand. Do you wait reading of the indictments? Yes, sir. 13 months after the deaths of his wife Maggie and son Paul, 54-year-old Alec Murdoch stood handcuffed inside the Colleton County Courthouse and was formally arraigned on two counts of murder and two counts of possession of a deadly weapon in the commission of a violent crime. What say you, Richard Alec Murdoch? Are you guilty or not guilty of the felonies wherein you stand and die? Not guilty. How shall you be tried? By God and my country. Richard Alec Murdoch was born and raised in South Carolina's Low Country. He met his wife Maggie at the University of South Carolina, where she was a member of Kappa Delta Sorority. They married in 1993. The next year, Alec graduated from law school. In 1996, Maggie gave birth to their first son, Buster. Paul was born three years later. Photos on Maggie's Facebook page show that Paul was an avid hunter and outdoorsman. It was Monday, June 7, 2021, when Maggie and Paul Murdoch were found brutally shot behind this outbuilding on this sprawling 1,700-acre Murdoch property. Alec Murdoch told police he arrived after 9 p.m., found the bodies, and called 911. Hey, Patty, 911, with your emergency? Hey, this is Alec Murdoch at 4147 Moselle Road. I need the police to immediately. My wife and child got it was just after 10 p.m. when Alec Murdoch made his 911 call. It was raining. It took first responders almost 20 minutes to arrive at the remote location. It's 4147 Moselle Road. I've been up to it now. It's bad. Okay. Oh. Okay, and are they breathing? No, ma'am. Okay, and you said it's your wife and your son? My wife and my son. Police documents show that less than a minute after the crime scene was secured, responding officers requested that the coroner be notified. According to the indictment, Maggie Murdoch was shot with a rifle and Paul Murdoch was killed with a shotgun. Alec Murdoch is known to own both types of weapons. Standing outside the front gate of the Murdoch estate more than a year after the murders, the grounds are overgrown, but it's so peaceful and quiet here in this rural area, standing in stark contrast to the chaos of June 7th, 2021. A two-lane road runs by the Murdoch property on Moselle Road. The area around it, woods and low-lying wetlands. The shooting deaths of Maggie and Paul Murdoch threw a spotlight on the rural counties that make up the 14th Judicial Circuit in South Carolina's low country where the Murdoch name is well known. Everybody knows the Murdochs, you know, it's a, it's a household name that's been here forever. For 87 consecutive years, three generations of Murdochs served as the solicitor, which, like a district attorney, is the area's top prosecutor. But Alec broke with the family tradition and stayed in private practice instead of pursuing a career of public service. When you have a, a family that is so powerful and has so much influence, it's it's easy to go off the rails a little bit. Prosecutors say that Alec Murdoch was leading a dangerous double life for at least 10 years before the murders of his wife and son, that he was so deeply in debt and had stolen millions from his law firm and clients, and that Paul's 2019 boat crash was threatening to collapse his financial house of cards. This is a white collar case that culminated in murder. Why would this particular individual murder his own wife and son? And the answer is because it allowed him to escape the accountability that was coming upon him that he's never had to deal with in his entire life. His defense team says Alec had no reason to murder Maggie and Paul and that the state's case is a rush to judgment. This is not a game. It's his life. It's justice. It's the quality of justice in this courtroom and this state, and it ain't a game. Day one of jury selection. Let's go right out to Court TV legal correspondent Chanley Painter. Join us live from outside the courthouse in Walterboro, South Carolina. Chanley, great to see you tonight. 
Um, tell us about the scene at the courthouse for day one of this huge trial. Yeah, Vinny, it's quiet now. But earlier today, just a couple hours ago, it was hustling and bustling. I've been here several times. We've covered this story from day one. We were here days after the double murders in 2021. Uh, we've been to this courthouse many times. This was unlike anything we had seen. I was surrounded, flanked by at least a couple dozen you know, members of the media uh, here outside the courthouse. And they were all on standby this morning to watch Alec Murdoch arrive at the courthouse. He did around 9 a.m. He's being held at the Colleton County Jail during the duration of his trial here in Walterboro. He, if you remember, was actually being held in Richland County uh, earlier where Columbia is, but he's here for the long haul. And as you can see in that video, just surrounded uh, by media, but also community members who are just taking this all in. The town of Walterboro has been preparing for this trial for months, which includes the extra security of the media parking lot that is across from me. That's at least the, the length of two uh, football fields, uh, Vinny. And also uh, we got food trucks too. We'll get to that in a second, but I caught up with a couple of those community members who stopped by to take this all in. Let's watch. You have this swarm of people from out of town coming to your small town. What is that like? It's crazy. It's like we're actually on the map for something because <laughs> we're just a really small town. <laughs> Nobody hears about us. We go to Charleston and well, usually if we go out of state, we tell people we live near Charleston because everybody knows Charleston. Nobody knows Walterboro. <laughs> You've been an attorney for a while. Have you ever seen anything like this at a courthouse? I've been an attorney for 55 years. and No, I have not. I uh, first practiced in a little town in New Jersey, Flemington, New Jersey, it was the home of the Lindbergh trial. So I heard vicariously about what happens with trials like this, but I never witnessed that it. it was before my time. Vinny, he's from your home state of New Jersey. Get this, his name's Bob Durst. Ring a bell. Uh, but uh, no relation to the uh, Bob Durst in California. But not far from where I'm sitting right here, uh, there's about a half a dozen food trucks that are here. Uh, they signed up to be here for the long, long haul to serve those court goers, the spectators, the prospective jurors, uh, hundreds that came in today, uh, the media. So it really has been beneficial to have that so close by. All right, make sure those trucks are still there next week uh, when I make my <laughs> way to the low country. They will be. Um, so let's talk about jury selection because this is a big, big case, right? small jurisdiction I can't imagine there might there's always somebody right who might not have heard of the case but I gotta imagine everybody's heard about it so how did things go here for day one of jury selection so it went smoothly in fact the judge made it through three of the four panels who were summoned here for day one of jury selection so Back in December, 900 jury summons were sent out by the Colleton County uh, Clerk of the Court. Uh, questionnaires were sent out. Those are returned. Well, earlier, four panels, about 200 or so each panel, not all showed up, of course, uh, here this morning. And just for some perspective, this is interesting, only about 38,000 in the entire county of Colleton County. That's the population here. But a lot of people here at the courthouse, they would line up right out front here to get in. Then they had to fill out the second questionnaire that was a little bit more case specific for the attorneys and the judge. Here in South Carolina, the judge is the only one who asks questions of the prospective jurors. Attorneys, like we typically see, they don't ask the questions here. They can submit questions to the judge, but the judge decides whether or not he or she wants to ask the uh, prospective jurors those questions. So again, we went through uh, three panels today, uh, around 30 or so qualified each for hardship, publicity, whether or not they knew the Murdochs, whether they could be fair and impartial. And get this, Vinny, we expect uh, this to wrap up possibly tomorrow. Not only uh, in that gallery did I see all the prospective jurors, there were no family members of the Murdochs. There were a lot of law enforcement agents agents who investigated this case, but there are also a lot of familiar attorneys that we've been talking to as far as uh, representing those victims of the alleged financial crimes of Alec Murdoch. 
um, including Eric Bland. Remember, Gloria Satterfield worked for the Murdoch family for almost 25 years before she fell tragically down the steps and died. Uh, he represented the, her estate against uh, the fraud that Al Murdoch admitted he committed against uh, that uh, family. And he actually was in court today and had some perspective on jury selection. Let's watch. I think in this day and age of the internet and, and just access to information, I don't think we want jurors that live under a rock. I just think we want jurors that could be fair and impartial. And you pretty much have to be uh, living in a cave if you haven't heard the name Alex Murdoch. So I think that the, the state and the defense can ultimately find a fair and impartial jury. You know, the state is looking for law and order types, people that are rule followers. The juror, the defense, I would think, would be looking for intellectual people that are questioning, you know, evidence that are not afraid to question authority or question um, certain suppositions. So, you know, I, I think Dick and his, his dreams would like to have a not guilty verdict, but I think he's shooting for one or two jurors to really be strong and be advocates in that jury room that would lead to a hung jury. And speaking of Dick Harputlian, the lead attorney for Alec Murdoch, he grew tired throughout the day. Uh, but you know they would turn their chairs and look at the prospective jurors in the gallery, and he yawned a lot, but he took notes, was attentive. Uh, Alec Murdoch, I know our cameras couldn't show jury selection, only the audio. He was so invested. He was in tune and focused. He took notes. He spoke to his lawyers. He had a, a big pamphlet of all the prospective jurors and had some even highlighted uh, as he sat there at council table. And he would uh, have his glasses, as we always see him in court, and he would hold them in his hands and he would twiddle them around kind of like this as he would look at the jurors. He'd put his glasses in his mouth and real pensive looks and then when there was a break and some of the individual jurors were taken behind the judge's bench he was quite congenial with the bailiffs guarding him joking smiling laughing turning around in his chair he seemed very comfortable as a former attorney would inside a courtroom yeah that's another different part of this case is that it is a lawyer who is in the defendant's chair now who's been in so many courtrooms for so many years Chanley Painter, stay where you are. When we come back, we're going to talk a little bit about blood spatter. We'll bring in our guests. Plus, coming up next hour. In Chula Vista, California, mother of three, Maya Milliette, disappeared more than two years ago. And now, her husband, Larry, has been charged with her murder. Shocking new evidence revealed in court during the preliminary hearing, including the last known images of Maya caught on camera. I don't think she disappeared, disappeared mysteriously. My investigation has continually brought me back to 2413 Paseo Los Gatos, and the, and the people who saw her, which includes our defendant. The life of Alec Murdoch is bizarre. It is complicated. This great South Carolina attorney is charged with the murders of his own wife and son. Okay, and are they breathing? No, ma'am. Who exactly is this guy? Everybody knows the Murdochs. It's a household name. A family that is so powerful. Who knows where this thing is going to end? This case needs to be resolved. We need to put this behind us and move on. Murdoch Family Murders. Live coverage weekday mornings only on Court TV. Forbeatschews.com. Your Honor, this is, been, was a week to the press a year ago that Al Murdoch had Paul Murdoch blood spatter, that was the shooter, because he had blood spatter. That First of all, Sweat will testify there's no blood. So I don't know how you have blood spatter. Number two, the DNA spot would exclude Paul. Exclude him. And number three, we believe the forensics are going to show that whoever shot Paul Murdoch and basically blew his head off would be covered in blood, not just spattered. Alec Murdoch's attorney arguing against the blood spatter evidence, but um, they still don't want it in. They still, they don't want it in. If it is blood spatter, again, that's a, a, a question of fact at this point. Take a look at what they filed here. A uh, motion to exclude blood spatter testimony of Deputy Kenneth Lee Kinsey. Uh, Richard Alexander Murdoch, by and through the underside counsel, moves the court to preclude the state 
from offering any testimony of Deputy Kenneth Lee Kinsey regarding blood spatter on a white t-shirt Murdoch was wearing when his wife and son were murdered because Deputy Kinsey states that, quote, after consideration of Tom Bevel's opinion, analysis reports and follow-up experimentation by Tom Bevel, this expert cannot render an opinion on whether the blood stains on Alex's white t-shirt are consistent with back spatter from a gunshot without an opinion on whether the stains are blood stains or whether the stains are consistent with back spatter from a gunshot. Any expert opinion testimony he would offer regarding the stains would not assist the trier of fact. So what's going on here? It looks like the, the state may have some issues with their experts and this blood evidence. Uh, let's bring back in, uh, coming to us tonight, outside the courthouse in the Low Country, Court TV legal correspondent Chanley Painter. Uh, Chanley, what else can you tell us about this motion to exclude this evidence? Yeah, Vinny, that's what the defense wants us to think in these motions. The state not responding in fools, but we have a motions hearing. Hopefully tomorrow we'll, re we'll learn more. This is so fascinating to me. I really am a little bit of a nerd about the forensics in a case here. Uh, but this T-shirt, it was a white T-shirt Alec Murdoch was wearing uh, the night his wife and son were murdered. A big point of contention. This motion today wants a second expert, a second blood pattern experts opinion about spatter on that shirt to be excluded. Here's part of this expert's opinion about that white shirt. It says the front of the white t-shirt contains what appears to be transfer and spatter from stains. The lower and larger stains are not spatter of any speed, but transfer from another object. The smaller stains that are present after treatment with LCV appear to be high velocity. So part of the shirt, according to the expert, is high velocity back spatter from the firing of a weapon. It was treated with this LCV, and that's a point of contention also. The court documents say that LCV is a leucocrystal violet, another presumptive test for blood, kind of like luminol, in which hemoglobin catalyzes the oxidation of LCV to a purple color. So it would turn this white shirt purple or this dark blue color to show that the stains are presumed to be blood. It's not a com confirmation of blood, but presumptive test that those spatter stains are blood again from firing a weapon. Now, the defense takes issue because in court documents, it says the side effect of this LCV testing is that it effectively destroys the shirt. As we see in those pictures, the entire shirt turns purple with all details that bleed into large, diffuse splotches. And SLED, the law enforcement division here in South Carolina, could have conducted that same test with luminol, which would not have destroyed the shirt. SLED chose to save a slight amount of effort at the expense of destroying this piece of evidence. Now, Vinny, further, because of this LCV method, and this is what I expect to hear from the prosecution in response tomorrow, that they will have experts to show that that LCV prevents the hematrace comp confirmation test that that's, that stain is blood. So ultimately, this defense motion is saying because they can't say for sure that it's blood on that shirt, then the spatter is irrelevant. It should all be kicked out according to the defense, but we expect more answers from the prosecution. So hopefully that breaks it down and makes a little more sense. Well, it does. First, you've got to establish that it's blood before you can say it's blood spatter stain, right? So I get where they're going. Uh, this is a big, big issue, it seems. Uh, how about the DNA tests on the shirts? What, what did that show? This is also very revealing. We broke it down because they took several clippings of this shirt and test it for DNA. Now, DNA can be more than just blood, right? It can be different forms of DNA. So here's the breakdown on this white shirt, again, that Alec Murdoch was wearing when at least the police responded after the 911 call. So the back of the shirt, the cuttings from the back of the shirt, positive for Maggie's DNA, Paul's DNA excluded. The front bottom hem cutting of this shirt, the first cutting, was positive for Paul's DNA. Maggie's DNA excluded. The second cutting, again from the bottom hem, positive for Maggie, 
Paul's DNA excluded. And then the upper front portion cutting of this shirt was positive for Maggie's DNA. Paul is either excluded or not considered because of his relatedness to the other contributors in that sample. But remember, when we played the sound coming into this segment, Vinny, and Dick Hartpoolian was saying, Paul's DNA is excluded. Well, that's the portion of the shirt that the experts think is blood spatter. And the spatter part of that shirt, Vinny, would have been when the alleged murderer was shooting Paul. So that's the conflict here. Uh, the back spatter would be from the shots of Paul, would have been close enough to cause the spatter on the shirt. But in that cutting where these 100 plus missed stains of back spatter are, Paul's DNA is excluded. But it is on other parts of the shirt. Not the perfect case for prosecutors. That's what I'm hearing from you, Chanley. That's what I'm hearing. All right, Chanley Painter, we're going to uh, uh, check back in with you in just a little bit, but I want to bring in some other guests who are joining us tonight in Port Royal, South Carolina. Criminal defense attorney, longtime acquaintance of Alec Murdoch, Jared Newman is with us in Somerville, South Carolina. Criminal defense attorney, former prosecutor, Susan Williams. And in Charlotte, North Carolina, the creator of the Murdoch podcast, Impact of Influence, which you'll be downloading after the show tonight. Matt Harris is with us. All right, great to see everyone. Jared, let me start with you. How big is this? Is it big? Is this a big deal, this blood spatter, this shirt, the cuttings, the testimony of the experts? I think it's huge. I read the motion. Um, I mean, this was a grisly crime scene. I'm actually seeing photographs that have pieces of skull in it. Uh, I've read about the LCV. I don't even know if they can prove human blood was on that shirt. Uh, I've read the motion back and forth going to this expert. I think the prosecution has screwed the pooch. I think this evidence is going to is so fouled up it's going to be inadmissible. Susan, how important is this for prosecutors to get this evidence in? Don't get me wrong, it's very important, but there are other pieces of evidence that we may or may not know about that the state has. And we'll be looking forward to hearing what those pieces of evidence are, whether it be circumstantial or pieces of evidence that are actually tangible. So, um, Matt, as we look at, at, at this issue, right, the, the spattered, I mean, is it even clear what he was wearing that day? No, and uh, one thing we should point out also, as the defense has mentioned, they don't have a chance to do their own testing. And that's a pretty huge thing since the shirt has been destroyed through all the, the, the test and whatnot. So that's important to point out. Uh, that was the shirt that he was wearing when the uh, paramedics showed up. That doesn't necessarily mean it was the shirt he'd been wearing all night long, or did he have a, uh, a coat on? Or was it a little bit of a rain off and on, if, if he was the shooter? So there is, there is, I think, one of the big questions is, since they can't test it themselves, will it be let in? Yeah. Uh, you know, the, um, Jared, let me ask you. You think it, there's a chance that it doesn't come in. Um, if it doesn't come in... Uh, is is there any? There's got to be other ways to get him there at the scene, but you have to get him there at the scene at the time of the shootings, right? Oh, sure. Uh, I, I'm sure there's other avenues. I mean, this this would be huge. But from what I've seen, I've read the motion. Um, it, it's just so um, gummed up the way they did it. Um, I think. I think Judge Newman is going to rule that shirt inadmissible. And what you do as a criminal defense attorney, you start pulling that thread. You pull the first one and the suit eventually comes off. All right, folks. Our guests are staying with us. When we come back, we're going to take you to the crime scene and try to figure out where everyone was situated and, and what it means in this case. Because apparently two victims, one defendant, but two different guns? We'll be right back. I've been up to it now. It's bad. Okay. Oh. Okay, and are they breathing? No, ma'am. Okay, and you said it's your wife and your son? My wife and my son. Okay, what is her name? Mag Maggie and Paul. Uh, Maggie uh, is her name? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. And please hurry. That's the 911 call. 
made by Alec Murdoch. He was there at the scene of the murder of his wife and son. The question is, was he there at the moment that they were shot and killed? Let's take a look at that crime scene right now. Uh, we've got a diagram for you. It gives you a little better idea of, of what was taking place here. Um, and apparently, Paul Murdoch had been shot two times with a shotgun in the confines of a feed slash mudroom that was connected to several covered but outdoor dog runs. Paul was discovered on the covered sidewalk outside the door of this room and was discovered prone, meaning face down, on the cement walkway. Maggie was a short distance away and was located at the northwest end of the repurposed hangar that is now a covered shed. Maggie Murdoch, also prone face down, had succumbed to several gunshots from a rifle. From a rifle. Huh. Here's the uh, gunshot wounds to Paul Murdoch. Remember, it's a rifle for Maggie, gun, uh, uh, um, a shotgun wound to his shoulder and head, small game shot. Entrance on the top left shoulder, traveling in the anatomical left to right direction, enters the left side of his neck and proceeds into his head. His brain was severed and exited through the anatomical right side of the head, upward trajectory, slightly front and back. Brain was completely detached from his head. No soot, stippling, terminal, immediate death. They are both shot more than once. Two different weapons. What's going on? What's going on at that crime scene? Let's bring back in our guests still with us, Jared Newman, Susan Williams, and Matt uh, Harris. Susan, one killer, two killers? What, what's the, two different weapons here. What's going on? Vinny, as you know, sometimes the killer or killers will do things to throw off crime scene investigators. That could be what's going on. We're also uh, at the scene of a hunting lodge where many guns are stored. So uh, not like many things with the Murdoff case, not your typical uh, scenario here. And, you know, seeing this scene just breaks my heart for the victims in this case. I know we're talking about this in terms of forensics, but there are two people that lost their lives and uh, my heart goes out to them. Absolutely. And then you've got family members who are seeking justice, but when the killer is a member of the family or the alleged killer, it gets even much more complicated uh, for the family. Matt Harris, let me ask you, have there been any alternative theories since all this happened that have been floated around that maybe we'll hear about, maybe alluded to at the trial, or just maybe a juror might be thinking about? Well, I, I think when it originally broke, uh, no one out of the gate was thinking Alec Murdoch. He still hadn't had the, the financial crimes thing, the Labor Day shooting and all the things that came after or the acknowledgement of the alleged opioid addiction. So. At first, there was talk of maybe a, a gang being involved. Walterboro Cowboys is a name that kept coming up. However, if you look at what happened at the crime scene, if these were trained killers, it took them five shots to handle Maggie. They used a rifle or a, a, a shotgun with two different kinds of ammunition, bird shot and buckshot, unusual. Uh, it doesn't seem like it would be this you know, sort of a trained assassin or hitman type situation uh, because of it just wasn't done well, if that were the case. Uh, and uh, also, I think one of the issues is for the state, I think, is going to be explaining how a man could shoot his son so graphically while the son was facing him right in the basically in the face. Uh, I'm not saying he didn't do it because of that, but right, that's a that's a, a jump you got to make to stealing money. Big, that. big issue. Speaking of the money, when we come back, we're going to talk about some of Alec Murdoch's financial problems and issues. Plus, um, coming up next hour. 
On the docket tonight in Santa Fe, New Mexico, A-list celebrity and award-winning actor Alec Baldwin will be criminally charged for shooting and killing Helena Hutchins on the set of a movie he was filming. Tonight, we show you the moment Baldwin finds out Helena died from the gunshot. This has been surely the worst situation I've ever been involved with. <clears throat> and I'm very hopeful that uh, the people in charge with investigating this whole thing get to the truth as soon as possible. And no one wants the truth more than I do. Kill you, I will end you, and I will destroy you. Someone they knew is back. I mean, you talk about high stakes, right? With a brand new season. This is how I'm going to die. New crimes. It was a brutal killing. New cases. You ask yourself, why? Committed by those closest to the victim. They seemed happy. Someone they knew with Tamron Hall. New season premieres February 19th. Only on Court TV. On Saturday morning, February 2nd, 2018, 57-year-old Gloria Satterfield fell down the front steps of Maggie and Alec Murdoch's home in Culleton County, South Carolina. There she had worked as a longtime housekeeper for the Murdochs for more than 24 years. She's on the ground. She's on the ground. Is she conscious? Uh, no, not really. Satterfield was taken to the hospital but suffered a stroke and went into cardiac arrest. Three weeks later, she died from her injuries. Now, after her death, Alec Murdoch met with Gloria Sons and told them how he planned to sue himself in order to secure an insurance settlement for them. He referred them to his best friend, fellow attorney and college roommate, Corey Fleming. They had Alex's insurance company pay $4.3 million, and none of the money went to the family and was split between Corey and Alex Murdoch. It wasn't until the fall of 2021, several months after Maggie and Paul were killed, that investigators began tracking Alec Murdoch's money trail. Alec Murdoch was arrested in October 2021, charged with 30 counts of financial crimes in the Gloria Satterfield case and held on $7 million bond. Six months later, in March of 2022, a judge approved a $4.3 million settlement in the lawsuit filed by Gloria Satterfield's sons, where he admitted that he was responsible and agreed to pay back the money. But her case was just the beginning. Gloria Satterfield doesn't appear to be the only target of Murdoch. Investigators say they uncovered evidence that he had been doing this for years, about a decade, stealing money from not only clients, but uh, folks at his law firm, even his own family members. The total, they say, about $9 million. Alec Murdoch is facing almost 100 counts of financial crimes dating back to 2011, including breach of trust, money laundering, computer crimes, and federal tax evasion. One of his alleged victims is a South Carolina highway patrolman that Murdoch is accused of stealing $192,000 from. I know Mr. Murdoch as my attorney. Always very nice to me, very cordial. But here's the problem. He treated me that nice, and he stole every dime I had uh, from the injury I incurred. Murdoch is accused of conspiring with Russell Lafitte, who was president of Palmetto State Bank, as well as Corey Fleming, Curtis Eddie Smith, and others to orchestrate many of his financial crimes, which the state says was motive to kill. A lot of people assume that this was a murder case, and then a few months later, there was some white collar thrown in there. This is a white collar case that culminated with two murders. Another reason this trial is so different, uh, most of the time spousal murders, it's like someone's cheating on someone or there's some insurance. Here it's different. 
way different allegation by the prosecution. Let's bring back in our guests, Jared Newman, Susan Williams, and Matt Harris still with us. Jared, um, why? Why would Alec Murdoch, he's so successful, his family has had so much power, he's got this land, these homes, why would he be stealing from clients? Could be for thrill, I don't know. I can't give you a motive on it. So, uh, Matt Harris, let me ask you something. Um, yeah. Do we think that he like buried a lot of money somewhere? Is he broke at this point? Does he have money? What's his, what's his current situation other than being incarcerated? Well, they say he is broke. That's, that's the word. They have an, enough money to, they took out of uh, some of the estate and sort of thing to pay to Carpootlian and attorneys and people are in line now, the, the Beach family from the, the, the boating uh, death of Mallory Beach. So there's a long line of people waiting to get whatever is left when this is all said and done. But if you're stealing nine million, eight, nine million, uh, you're getting a salary that at times is a million dollars a year and you live in the low country and you are not living uh, in, in, in Colleton County as a king, I want to know where all the money went. Uh, it certainly wasn't all on Oxy, as we've been told, uh, because no one's alive after $9 million of Oxy. So where is it? There, it's got it's, it's somewhere or spent on something bad. You're not stealing $9 million and giving it to charity to hide it. So it's, it was used in, in some nefarious way. Susan, let me ask you, what impact will this conduct have if the jury hears it? Prosecutors want to bring it in, saying it's part of the motive here. Um, what, do, what do you think the ultimate impact would be, though, on a jury down there in the low country, and they hear about him stealing from clients, stealing from his law partners? Well, Vinny, that is the theory of the state. If Judge Newman allows those prior bad acts to come in, then it's gonna be up to the jury to decide. And if they can jump from these allegations of financial crimes to a murder, they're the finders of the fact and they will have the final say. But at this point, we don't even know if those prior bad acts will, will be uh, allowed into evidence. That's one of the pending pretrial motions. Yeah, this judge does it, likes to make the call right at the time of the trial. A little different than many of the judges in a lot of the cases we cover. Um, Jared, what do you think of the motive here, the, the alleged motive that's been presented by prosecutors? I don't know. I don't know if I really buy it. Um, you know, you kill one of them to get sympathy for you. But, I mean, this looked like a gang-style hit, uh, you know. So I, I, I just... I, I can't see that tying in with what I know about Alex that that he'd even need that. So uh, Matt and I'm, I'm still trying to. I, he got away with this for. Do we know how far back some of this uh, this bad behavior with uh, money goes? It's about ten years. Is the is the general consensus ten to twelve years? Yeah. So it's been going on for a while, and I think it's kind of a double edged sword if the stuff comes in about uh, Alec and ripping all these people off and treating all these people poorly, that gives also a lot of people reason to want to get revenge. So, uh, Susan, what would you do if you were the judge? Would you, would you allow prosecutors to bring some of this stuff in so they could argue their theory of the case? Because as we've all been saying tonight, um, you know, you, you need a reason why this guy would face his son and shoot him in the face, like looking at him and then blow his head off. It's hard for me to put my, sit in the shoes of Judge Newman. He is someone who's a veteran judge and I still wanna hear all, if there are any more arguments to be made uh, before I would make a final decision on that. But um, I can see the state's position where everything sort of came down on Alec Murdoff at the same time. The financial part is just one continuous uh, series of events that occurred that, that led to more and more destruction. But I can also see from the defense side that prior bad acts typically are not admissible when uh, in, a, in a situation like this. So it's going to be a tough decision to make. I can see both sides of it, though. So, Jared... You know, if they have the scientific evidence and say a jury's sort of buying that, do you, do you think it's 100% necessary that they need a 
real motive in all of this? Well, based on the motion I saw, they don't have the scientific evidence. They don't have the weapons. They get very little forensics. If I were Judge Newman, I'd split the baby. I'd say, you proved the murder, and I'll let you put in motive after that. All right. Jared Newman, Susan Williams, Matt Harris helping us out tonight. Um, we'll be down there. I'll be down there next week. Hopefully all three of you can join.